Since the last video I've done on the ARM2 homebrew computer, I've done some experimentation with a slightly more complex program, and I've been trying to understand the bus activity that I'm seeing, and I thought I'd talk you all through it. On the hardware side, I've wired through more address lines to the ROMs, so that I can run programs up to uh, 16 instructions long now, and I'll keep adding more address lines as necessary when I write longer programs. And I've also started wiring up this LCD module, but I took a break from that to check that the bus is ready for sending writes as well as handling reads. So this just has the contrast control and backlight power hooked up at the moment. And in the middle here, I've wired the memory request and read write signals through to the end two LEDs, just so that I can see what's going on with them as the program runs. So bear in mind that they're not part of the address, even though they're right on the end of it. And when I turn this on, you can see it running. A couple of things came up here. Firstly, I need to provide a proper reset signal, otherwise it doesn't necessarily start in the right place. And secondly, I've had to turn the clock speed up a bit because some things weren't working properly at the lower clock rate. I'm still not running at the uh, speed that it says in the datasheet. I'm still well below that. And if I keep seeing things go wrong, I'm going to have to keep turning the clock speed up until they go right again. Uh, but it's nice to see the program running, and you can see that it is running with some activity on the read versus write LED, second from right, that shows the program's trying to write some data. So we'll come back to this in a little bit, and I'll step through the video to show more clearly what's happening on each cycle. But first, let's uh, take a look at the program itself. It's a very simple one. We start by loading hex AA into register 12, then enter a loop which adds 1 to R0, storing the result back in R0. Uh, the first R0 here is the destination register, and the other two are the arguments to add. And then it stores R0 in the address held in R12 plus 1, which would be AB. And then it stores R0 again in the address held in R12, which is AA, this time without adding 1. And finally it loops back to the add instruction. I put NOPs in the rest of the 16 addressable memory locations, but in practice they never run anyway. However, remember that due to the pipelining, after the branch instruction, the next two NOPs will be read from memory, just not executed, uh, as we saw in the last couple of videos. And I'll explain better why that happens later in this video. So bearing in mind the program code, let's step through the video from before, one cycle at a time, and see what's on the bus. I'm going to log this and afterwards explain in more detail what's going on. So let's call this cycle, cycle zero. Uh, the CPU has put address zero on the bus and is executing a read from memory hence both the two write LEDs being off. And this is reading the first opcode of the program. Next on cycle one, the CPU is reading from address four. Uh, remember the bottom two address bits aren't shown here, they're almost always zero, but this slip bit here is bit two, so this is a four. And that's reading the second opcode. After that, we read from address eight, then 12, then 16, which is reading the two store instructions and then the branch instruction. Now all of a sudden everything lights up, and this is the store to address AA plus um, 1. Notice that the second LED from the right, the read-write LED, is lit now, indicating a write operation. And I actually made a mistake here in the program. It's not really legal to store a 32-bit word to a non-aligned address. It doesn't cause any exceptions, it's just not something that the CPU generally supports, and it generally behaves like a store to the rounded down value of the address, rounded down to the next multiple of 4. So, oops. Anyway, continuing on, the CPU next reads from address 20. This is the opcode fetch for the first NOP instruction after the branch, as it doesn't yet know that it will take the branch. It's still executing the stores from earlier on, so, you know, if it was a conditional branch, there's no way it could know whether it would end up taking it or not. Now we see it executing the second store to location AA without adding one. And in the end, this is the same thing as the previous store due to the rounding behavior I just mentioned. They both round down to the same multiple of four. After that, it reads from address 24, prefetching the second NOP after the branch. And finally, it takes the branch and goes back to read the second instruction of the program again from address 4. And it, and it continues looping just as expected. So now let's take a proper look at what really happened there. Uh, my main reason for doing this was to make sure everything's fine before I started hooking up two-way devices like the LCD display. I don't want to get things wrong and end up with the CPU and LCD both writing to the bus at the same time, for example. So I need to make sure that I'm confident I can keep the LCD under control. 
So to try and understand the flow better, I logged all the bus operations in a spreadsheet and annotated it like this. Each column represents one instruction in the program, and I also coloured the actions taken by the CPU into blocks according to which instruction was responsible. Each instruction stays in the pipeline for at least three cycles. Uh, first it's fetched, then it's decoded, and then it's executed. And some instructions require more than one execution cycle. This first one though is fetched on cycle 0, and decoded on cycle 1, and executed on cycle 2. It's just a simple data operation, so it only has one execute cycle. And note that the decode and execute for this instruction don't need the bus, so the second opcode can be fetched during the first instruction's decode cycle, and the third instruction's opcode is fetched during the first instruction's execute cycle. And I think that's kind of always the case. Um, as far as I know for ARM instructions, I think the first execute cycle never needs the bus itself. So, so during the first execute cycle for any instruction, it always prefetches the one two ahead. And I coloured the bus operations on the left hand side to try and make it clearer which of the executing instructions each bus operation corresponds with. The third instruction is more interesting though. So for one thing, it takes more than one cycle to execute. And for another, it's a store instruction, so it needs bus access as well. Up to the point when it executes, everything is the same as before, and we still prefetch the next two instructions. I think that's also always the case for ARM when an instruction is about to execute, the pipeline should be full with two prefetched instructions. And the first execute cycle for a store instruction is for calculating the target address. On the second execution cycle though, it needs bus access, and the pipeline's also full, so it doesn't prefetch on this cycle, and so the bus is available for the store operation to take place. And you can see that happening. And that's the end of the store instruction. Now looking at the fourth instruction, highlighted in blue in the center, you can see that after being decoded, it had to wait before executing. Uh, the CPU can only execute one instruction at a time, and the previous instruction hasn't finished yet because it's a two cycle instruction. After that though, this instruction executed in two more cycles, just like the previous one did. Uh, more, more complex store instructions I think can take more cycles, but they're quite rare. Next, uh, look at the fifth instruction in orange, the branch instruction, and this one's really interesting. So for one thing, there was a big gap between decoding and executing, which is due to the combination of two store instructions preceding it, both of which kind of took one extra cycle to execute. And in this gap, the first NOP got prefetched, um, but that's really associated with the second store instruction, I think, as I said before, rather than the branch. So, you know, the first, the first cycle of the second store instruction uh, included that prefetch. Then the branch instructions nominally take three cycles to execute. Uh, the first cycle calculates the target address, and that gets overlapped with the NOP code read as usual. And the CPU knows by this point whether the branch will be taken, as it has started to execute it. However, it didn't know early enough to avoid the prefetch, because, as we saw in the last couple of videos, it needs to tell the memory system a whole cycle in advance, which memory access will occur on the following cycle. So by this point it's already committed to doing the prefetch. On the second and third cycles, with the program counter updated to the branch destination, the CPU performs opcode prefetches from there to refill the pipeline. If the branch had been a branch and link instruction, uh, which is like a subroutine call, then it would also update the link register, register 14, during this period to allow the return from the subroutine to work later on. Um, and basically the way that works is register 15 is the program counter, and it gets copied into register 14 and subtracted a little bit from, so that at the end of a subroutine, the way you return is simply by moving it back from register 14 to register 15. And after that, we're back to executing the second instruction of the program again from address 4. Uh, it was already prefetched and decoded during the branch instruction, and the third instruction is also already prefetched. So just like before, we're ready to execute the add while decoding one store instruction and prefetching another. So hopefully this all makes sense. Uh, making this diagram helped me a lot in understanding it, I think. Um, I referred to the datasheet for details of what all the instructions were actually doing in their execute cycles, which was very helpful, and it has interesting tables too, um, like these, which kind of show all of the different cycles and what's going on on them for different combinations of operands to the instructions as well, because some of them vary quite a lot.
But it's only really after making this diagram that it kind of all seemed to make sense to me. So I hope that's been helpful for you guys as well and interesting to look through. So there we are. As I showed earlier, I'll probably be hooking up an LCD module soon so that I can run programs with better output and maybe lean on that to debug uh, other issues I come across. I think RAM will come after that. It's not as important on this as it is on a 6502 because there are a lot more registers with ARM and things like subroutine calls work fine without RAM because, they, because the link register is just a register. It doesn't use the stack for the return address. So you can write significantly more complex programs without actually needing to store anything in RAM. And as I said before, I'll be looking into getting away from burning ROMs because it's really painful having to burn four of them every time I change the program. I'd be really interested to know how interested you guys are in the software stack I'm using. Um, I'll show some kind of screenshots here of the kind of code and make files and things I'm using to, to, to build the code here. Um, if, you, if you're interested in more details about this, do let me know. I was going to cover it a bit more in this video, but the instruction pipeline was uh, too interesting not to deep dive into. But yeah, if, you, if you'd like a bit more detail about the software stack here, then let me know. Broadly, it's just GCC and under Ubuntu, you can very easily install an ARM cross compiler which has out-of-the-box support for ARM2, including things like the 26-bit address bus. They haven't got rid of that yet from the compiler. And I'm using opt-copy here to strip off all the ELF headers and things like that and just output a plain uh, byte stream that I can put onto the ROMs. And a little Python script to split the byte stream up into uh, different bytes for different ROMs. Anyway, I hope you guys found the uh, deep dive into the pipelining interesting. Um, I was really interested to learn about it. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope you guys like it too. As always, let me know if there's anything in particular you'd be interested in seeing next. Otherwise, I'll just plow on. And um, yeah, see you next time.